All right, welcome to uh, what I'm hoping to be a complete overview of uh, J.W.F. Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit from 1807. Um, this uh, overview is uh, extremely condensed, um, extremely shortened. Um, if you want a more in-depth overview of each section, chapter by chapter, uh, you can find that under the playlist on my channel for the Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm doing this uh, very simplified overview is to sort of give you um, a sense or a, or a simplified concept of what this book is about, um, as well as uh, the man who wrote it. Uh, because I'll be leading a course on the Phenomenology of Spirit starting January 15th of this year. That is in about uh, a week's time. So if you're interested in um, enrolling in that course, we will be uh, exploring each chapter in great detail. Um, we will have live sessions where we will be uh, discussing each section in great detail. Uh, we will also have the option of one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with me to work through the concepts, uh, to work through uh, the different major themes of the chapter, and also collective uh, work groups where we will be ultimately working towards developing our own understanding of the phenomenology of spirit for uh, the present moment, including uh, hopefully a conference and an edited book series. So if you're interested in getting in on that, uh, action, then check the link in the description on philosophyportal.online, and uh, you can enroll before January 15th, or alternatively, you can email me personally uh, directly if you have any uh, questions or comments about how the course will be structured um, and what you might hope to get out of the course. So with that being said, I will get into the presentation. Um, on the phenomenology of spirit. So this is, um, again, a very simplified version, which I hope will uh, give you a sense of what this book is really about. So first, the man Hegel himself. Hegel is uh, one of the most important figures, if not the most important figure of German idealism. He's often framed as the culmination um, of German idealism, uh, in the coming to be of uh, German idealism. He is also often um, named as one of the greatest philosophers in Western history. His name is often uh, associated with the most important names in Western philosophy from Plato and Aristotle to Descartes and Kant, as well as the more contemporary uh, thinkers like uh, like a Heidegger or a Deleuze. Hegel influenced many modern theories in aesthetics, epistemology, ontology, and politics, not to mention also theology. Um, the range of concepts and the range of thinkers and the range of ideas that have been influenced by Hegelian thinking um, is really so vast and so expansive that it's um, dizzying or disorienting. Um, many could argue that the structure of the 19th and 20th century politically, uh, theologically, um, epistemologically have been, have been, um, influenced, uh, massively by Hegelian thinking. Um, perhaps the most obvious example of that is the development of Marxism. Um, uh, the interpretations that um, emerged in Marx's work uh, are largely attributed to Marx's engagement with Hegel. Um, not to mention many of the greatest thinkers of 19th and 20th century philosophy are um, directly influenced by their reading of Hegel. So there's a huge uh, impact that he's had on um, human thought. Now, in, for Hegel himself, his thinking was largely shaped by the French Revolution. 
Um, this is the context, the political context uh, in which he's writing. It's a time of enormous social upheaval. It's a time where thought is, as it were, thrown into an abyss, where um, presuppositions of what a society is, presuppositions of what human reality is, are, um, it's basically an enormous transition. Uh, in this entire climate, Hegel is also wrestling with the emergence of Kantian critical philosophy. Um, Kant is questioning the very limits of reason, the critique of pure reason. Uh, he is suggesting that reason uh, is fundamentally limited by uh, antinomies, by contradictions. And that this opens the door to a scientific metaphysics. Um, he is also influenced by contemporary philosophers who are quite famous in their own right. Uh, thinkers like Johann Fichte, who was very much thinking about the notion of freedom, uh, both in a human sense and a deeper ontological sense in the context of the emancipatory political movements of the French Revolution. Uh, also thinkers like Friedrich Schelling, who is thinking about art and aesthetics, specifically as it relates to the absolute. So these are the forces, these are the social dynamics that are shaping Hegel's thinking. Uh, these are the um, events and persons who Hegel is most deeply immersed in and 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 discussing with, and from this context, uh, we will have the emergence of two of the most um, famous books. There are, of course, others, but these two I'm going to highlight as two of Hegel's most famous works: the Phenomenology of Spirit on the left and the Science of Logic on the right. The Phenomenology of Spirit is basically a book that's aiming to bring ordinary consciousness to the standpoint of absolute knowing. Um, the book is a phenomenological adventure which takes thought through logical categories of its own development. Um, and that's what this video is going to hopefully be a uh, in-depth, uh, an in-depth description of. The basic idea here is that if we are interested in questions about absolute being, or if we are in, interested in questions about the nature of the absolute, um, we cannot even start to ask ourselves questions about that without having an understanding of our own knowing, uh, without having an understanding of the way our mind works or our cognition works, to use perhaps contemporary language, but also Hegel also uses that term cognition. So he's interested in the phenomenology and understanding cognition. He's interested in understanding how cognition relates to the truth and also its process of becoming. Uh, from that, he also offers us the science of logic. Um, one can say that it's possible to reach the standpoint of the logic without having gone through the phenomenology. Um, one might do that by simply having um, tested oneself throughout the entirety of one's own journey and battle with the truth, um, being radically critical, radically skeptical um, about the nature of truth and how one goes about knowing the truth. Um, however, with that being said, it is kind of uh, built into Hegel's thinking that one works through the phenomenology of spirit to ultimately discard it. Um, bringing one to a inner knowing, potentially, in which one can start to entertain the science of logic. Um, he starts the science of logic as ultimately a critique of Kant uh, and the notion of Kantian categories, a priori categories, asking where does Kant derive these categories? Kant has 12 different categories, um, and Hegel's basically saying, or basically interested in how those categories are derived, 
um, the historicity, the emergence, the genesis of those concepts. And consequently, he starts the, his logic uh, and starts his philosophy in a totally presuppositionless state. And from that state, uh, attempts to, again, derive categories. How, how, how are categories um, that structure the way we think about being uh, themselves uh, emerging? Um, and that, depending on he different interpretations, you could say that that is merely a theory, an epistemological theory of categories. Uh, you can also make stronger claims about the metaphysics and the ontological implications of that project. Um, ultimately, here I'm going to suggest that the phenomenology of spirit and the science of logic combined um, bring one to a standpoint of knowing which can logically entertain thoughts about the truth of absolute being, um, can investigate the nature of those questions um, I want to say in a non-ideological way, that might be a little bit controversial to state, but um, at least it is a radical defense mechanism against approaching questions about the absolute, um, approaching questions of fundamental importance to um, human life, life and death, the nature of God, the nature of ultimate reality. Um, which are coming basically from a, let's say, a, a more mature um, spiritual standpoint. So Hegel's phenomenology of spirit itself is structured by um, very simple categories. Um, here you're seeing the total outline of the book as it will be covered in the course. We are going to be focused in this video on running through the way in which Hegel explores the categories uh, running from consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, religion, and absolute knowing. Um, I'm going to hope to make clear how Hegel's logic works, um, the basic method of his thinking. Um, how he attempts to understand the interiority uh, of consciousness, the interiority of self-consciousness, how self-conscious, what the problem self-consciousness is dealing with, the interiority of reason, spirit, religion, and ultimately absolute knowing. So starting with consciousness, um, just to start to give an overview of how I'm going to run through these different categories, there's going to basically be a, a, a series of triads, a series of triangles, which structure the interiority of each of the logical categories. Um, the interiority of that phenomenon is going to uh, work through these categories before coming to an understanding of the lack internal to that level. Um, in other words, it will explore positively the dimension of consciousness before finding out the dimension within consciousness that is lacking or missing. So, and then from that lack, from that uh, absence, um, the next logical category will be derived. So in this case, self-consciousness. So interior to consciousness, there is basically an exploration of sense certainty, perception, and understanding. Uh, sense certainty is uh, our basic sense faculties, sight, smell, taste, touch, uh, hearing. These senses are the way in which we first come into contact with uh, impressions of being. Um, here I have an image of an infant, and you can think about an infant as a, a entity which derives its truth from sense certainty. Uh, Hegel is here basically um, critical of sense certainty for its uh, capacity to deceive and fool the subject into thinking that it has the absolute truth. Like, for example, he'll reference in the phenomenology of spirit the... Um, 
ecstatic ceremonies of the ancient world in which one fully uh, indulged in sense certainty. Uh, through feasting, through drinking, through orgiastic expression, right? And ultimately coming to the emptiness of sense certainty, the fact that all senses uh, disappear, uh, the, the fullness and the richness of all sense certainty disappears uh, into uh, the emptiness and the vapidness and the vacuousness of the phenomena. And that brings one naturally internal to consciousness itself to perception. And perception is um, distinct from sense certainty in the fact that it creates a object. And the object of perception um, basically takes on a universality um, and let's say a multiplicity in that universality, a multiplicity of objects in a universal medium of um, different objects. Um, perception, the moment of perception um, is, let's say, universal. Um, however, the problem of perception is that while the universality of the object in that moment is universal, it again falls away in the fact that um, there's no capacity to share the logic of that perception in a uh, realm of others. In, in other words, in, with a shared understanding. Um, so I can enjoy uh, an object in a universal sense, perhaps, but that uh, enjoyment cannot be extended or shared um, in a way with an other self-consciousness. And that brings us to um, the understanding where basically the objects of perception become uh, embedded in a larger um, conceptual matrix of uh, thinking. However, this understanding and its relationship ultimately with sense certainty, uh, it, this, this, this triangle, of course, closes on itself, is missing something. That is basically self-consciousness, an understanding of self, an understanding of the very entity which is sensing, which is perceiving, and which is understanding. And so that brings us to the development of the ego, um, a development of the notion of a self that there is a self, actually, that is sensing, perceiving, and understanding. And so the self recognizes itself, the fact that it is a sort of a unitary thing. Now, that unitary thing is an image. Um, this has many overlaps and connections to modern, um, the modern development of psychoanalysis and many other theories of psychology. Uh, but that egoic reflection is ultimately um, specular in itself, um, that it is a an image of unity which does not have a stable ground. It merely has a fragmented body. And that image is ultimately dependent on and regulated by a network of social relationships. And intersubjective conflict is derived from this um, fact that we as social beings fundamentally are always dependent on and being mediated by a realm of others. That there are other egos in more or less the same existential situation that we are. Um, of course, uh, it's different for a child or a teenager or a young adult um, in relationship to an, an older, more mature, more developed spirit to uh, deal with intersubjective conflict, but sometimes not. An intersubjective conflict is um, very much relative to the nature of the self, which is 
um, experiencing that conflict and and what's important and what that subject desires. Uh, um, there can be very extreme, of course, intersubjective conflicts throughout our entire existence, no matter how mature we are um, in some situations and no, no matter how old we are, certainly. Um, but ultimately, what this intersubjective conflict is... What is producing, let's say, this intersubjective conflict is the fact that there is no social ideal, that the, 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 the social world is structured by a lack, and that we're all basically um, wrestling with this lack, and that there is no other that can save us or reconcile us with our social situation, and that there is a, let's say, an irreducible conflict or a absence of perfect cooperation and that this uh, creates an enormous internal and external struggle, um, which again closes back on itself with egoic reflection, and this is the battle of the self. Now, this self-consciousness ultimately then brings us to the lack internal to the self-consciousness, which is that it lacks a rational understanding of nature and society, that it has yet to come to a proper understanding of why this triangle is the way it is, which is, requires a rational understanding of of the external world and also the social world in order to come to terms with it. And that that's where we enter reason. Reason here is uh, mostly concerned with, first and foremost, the formulation of physical laws, but that also extends to uh, biology and psychology where uh, laws are not so much um, applicable, convincingly applied. Um, laws, in other words, are useful at describing the way the physical world functions, gravity, uh, the four forces. However, when it comes to biology, we can only describe the reality in terms of its um, habits or its tendencies. Um, it's inner, and this is basically because biology, the very nature of biology is structured by a inner dimension, uh, which has its own, uh, instincts or drives, um, which cannot be neatly, uh, categorized into, uh, formalizable laws or general laws. There's a irreducible singularity that emerges in the level of biology and of course becomes even more intensely... Um, obvious on the level of psychology. Um, in any case, uh, reason also then shifts to its own inner world, not only interested in developing an understanding of physics and biology and psychology, but also the very nature of thought, uh, laws of abstraction, where Hegel emphasizes that thought is brought to an understanding of the concept of negativity, that thought is ultimately a an abstraction is ultimately a negative function um, that it is um, or you could also say a su sublating function that thought is constantly um, overcoming itself um, before ultimately attempting to think about its ethical life and moral destiny and this has a lot to do with the fact that there's a fundamentally on the level of self-consciousness a lacking social ideal which makes ethical life necessary to think rationally and also a moral destiny. Um, what is the destiny of the human species and what is my role in that destiny? Um, what does it mean to live an ethical life? What does it mean to think an ethical life? These are things that reason starts to wonder about, um, become captured by as mysterious. Um, and ultimately, reason cannot solve it. Not only can reason not solve any of these things um, in an absolute way or in a final way, um, but reason starts to recognize that it, in its own mechanics, uh, in the way it tries to symmetrically align its thinking processes with being, um, that it fundamentally lacks grounding, that it fundamentally lacks um, pragmatic insight and communal duty. In other words, 
Uh, reason is lacking a spiritual dimension of its life. Reason is lacking a embodiedness and an embeddedness um, in the realm of others, uh, practically speaking or pragmatically speaking. And so that brings us to the level of spirit. Spirit here is not just focused on pragmatism, although that's where it starts, that spirit recognizes that its reason is not king, that its reason recognizes that it's failing and that it's not capable of really practically embedding it in a living world, a, a world that's on fire with the heart, let's say. Um and so the pragmatism has to be directed or the utilitarianism has to be directed towards self-insight. Um, that through a pragmatic engagement that has as its aim self-insight as it relates to the way spirit is engaged in, with self, the way spirit's engaged with the world, um, that that is really what's organizing pragmatism. That's really what's organizing utilitarianism. Otherwise, it's just, again, merely empty. And that brings spirit to the notion of its own duty in the world. And Hegel says that this duty in the world can only be derived from conscience, um, that one is connected to one's own conscience, that one's connected to one's own, um, let's say, one's own inner ethical imperative, um, which then allows spirit to act with a higher level of confidence, um, with a higher level of self-assurance that it is sort of meaningfully engaged in the world of others. However, there is a crushing and a brutal realization that this connection to conscience, conscious duty um, does bring about totally new conflicts, social conflicts, because um, if I'm connected to my duty and someone else and other people are connected to their duty and their conscience, that doesn't mean that we are reconciled. In fact, quite the opposite. It often can mean that our duties are in conflict. It can mean our duties are in contradiction with each other and we will have to go separate ways. Sometimes these conscious conflicts are irreconcilable. And so uh, through giving oneself to this process, uh, spirit recognizes that there is a um, duality, a lack of unity um, in a spirit which is beyond rational consensus, which is beyond um, rational mediation. Um, and that this is one of the most heartbreaking and one of the most difficult dimensions of spiritual life. Um, that spirit uh, finds itself in this unfortunate situation of being stuck in irreducible conflicts and irreducible battles with others who are also just simply living their uh, truest self-notion. So this is a very painful, painful reality for spirit. And it ultimately brings spirit to the notion of a concrete universal idea, namely that it brings spirit to a search for religion. So on the level of religion, um, Hegel emphasizes that spirit starts its understanding of religion in a formless light, let's say an empty, open light, uh, which is the spirit itself, let's say. And from this, uh, attempts to again cultivate an understanding of its ethical conscience, which had got it, gotten it into so much um, irreconcilable conflict with other spirits, but this time trying to uh, embed this ethical conscience in a universal idea, uh, which brings spirit to uh, the formation of a higher social order under the universal idea, what Hegel uh, calls a cult um, and a devoted cult. Now, what he means by a cult is a small group or a smaller scale group of individuals who are organized around a universal idea, which he then um, suggests is what leads to the formation of nations or the process of nation building, where there is a complex uh, dialectical development of 
um, processes involving the emergence of heroes and the emergence of figures, which become essentially important for creating this national comedy, uh, which houses spirit in a larger totality than itself, a totality which claims concrete universality. Um, and in that process of nation building, in that process of the emergence of heroes and the emergence of great figures and leaders, um, this process is mediated by a confrontation with absolute revelation and the desire to create a divine society. So figures who are uh, figures connected to the absolute, figures who have uh, experienced the absolute in transcendent experiences, um, and who not only experience the absolute in a transcendent sense, but also, and most importantly, are committed to dying and dying again better for that idea um, in the embodiment and in the embeddedness of that idea in a society throughout the fabric of society itself. However, while religion develops the universal idea beyond their individuality and ultimately towards the community, um, religion lacks an understanding of the universal idea as a contradiction. In other words, that there are multiple universal ideas. Um, to give a practical example, uh, when Hegel's talking about religion, he's talking about, about not just one religion like Christianity or Islam or Judaism or Hinduism or Taoism or Buddhism, but talking about religion as such, talking about the religious layer of the idea. Um, and that religion as a layer or as a universal idea is in contradiction. Uh, and this brings us to the fact that spirit is lacking or what religion is lacking on this layer is absolute knowing. So absolute knowing is most fundamentally the fact of universal contradiction. Um, but in a positive sense, that contradiction is seen as a positive for working on the level of universality on a, in a concrete way. So one traverses the phenomenon, phenomenon, phenomenal drama, phenomenal drama to an active universality, which requires confronting the level of contradiction on a universal level. However, one does not abandon synthesis or does not abandon um, conceptual thinking, which strives for totality. It is rather a form of conceptual synthesis or a form of conceptual totality, which is in and with otherness, which is capable of confronting the other, which is capable of confronting the unknown, which is capable of confronting difference in a fundamental sense. And from this conceptual synthesis in and with otherness is capable ultimately within oneself, uh, is capable of what Hegel would refer to as an abyssal self-determination. That one self-determination does not come out of any mimicry of an idea outside of oneself through some external religious idea or notion, but that one is uh, in relationship to, in some sense, an abyssal ground. One could say that this has a a uh, fundamental connection to the spirit's confrontation with death. So absolute knowledge is ultimately uh, an idea of self-contradiction with the other. That other is most fundamentally something that we could think about as death. And that this uh, successful integration, let's say, with absolute knowing, allows spirit to engage in the phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenon, I cannot say that word, can engage in the phenomenal drama as if from without. So one, uh, while one's in this phenomenal drama, in the processes of consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, religion, these are experienced as radical um, discontinuities in the process of becoming. However, once in the state of absolute knowing, one can uh, perceive the logical continuities of all of these categories and also engage with people within these logical categories as if they're without it. Um, one could say that absolute knowing is the positivity of negativity of the missing being, of the missing absolute being, which is why we're interested in cultivating a stance of absolute knowing in the first place 
which is because we are interested in cultivating a stance of knowing which can even start to investigate the nature of absolute being. So here, this is my representation of the book in its totality, which gives you a kind of fractal structure. You have all of these repeating triangles or triads, um, which uh, blend or merge into each other on the level of consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, religion, and finally absolute knowing. Not for a total sublation of being or a total knowing which knows everything, but rather a stance of knowing that can actually empty itself of the lower levels and confront real otherness or real difference. Um, some important things to say about this structure is that the idea here uh, in Hegel is kind of always already, in other words, consciousness uh, is always there, namely uh, there are always individuals being born. Um, Self-consciousness is likewise always there, reason, spirit, religion, absolute knowing. In other words, throughout the entirety of the history of the idea, the logical development of the idea, there's always a religious layer. Uh, there is always a layer of absolute knowing beings. Um, what's really at stake, I think, with this structure as a model for society um, is our conscious uh, acceptance or our conscious uh, capacity to understand the logic of the idea, how it unfolds, um, help guide processes of development dialectically, um, and also integrate and connect various levels of this structure um, in order to ensure the integrity of the whole structure. In other words, to ensure that the layer of absolute knowing is connected to the layer of religion so that religions don't become overly dogmatic. Um, to connect the layer of a religion to the layer of individual spirit to make sure that uh, spiritual processes of de development are being cultivated, that we are taking into consideration the coming to be of the religious idea. To make sure that spirit is connected to re reason so that our rational um, knowledge workers, our rational society, um, is still capable of doing the work that's necessary without becoming empty and vacuous in itself. Um, that there's spirit, that there's a aliveness. To make sure that reason is connected to self-consciousness so that we do not end up in narcissistic image warfare with each other. Um, to make sure that self-consciousness is connected to consciousness so that we are um, aware of our basic drives to make sure that we are aware of our basic instinctual impulses, our sense certainty, and to integrate it and work with it as best as we can as, um, as, a, as, as selves who are concerned about understanding the realm of others. Um, so there are many processes here at work in the idea as a historical totality um, and Hegel here in the phenomenology is hoping um, that by working through the phenomenology, one can be brought to a rational understanding of the idea as such, not one's own individual rationality, but the reason, the cunning of reason of the idea. And ultimately, for those capable of thinking and being with absolute knowing, um, influencing the future of philosophy and science and the standpoint of knowing. So that is the basic structure. Again, you have um, the foreword and the introduction, which are their own beast, uh, and the preface, which is certainly its own standalone beast, which we'll be covering in the course. Uh, but here I hope I've given a uh, overview of the consciousness um, Self-consciousness, reason, spirit, religion, absolute knowledge, the basic triads which structure these levels, of course, massively simplified for this video, um, the connections between the levels, how the positivity is explored before uh, discovering the underlying negativity, um, uh, which leads to the next level, and um, ultimately to the standpoint of absolute knowing. So that is an overview of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Again, I will be starting a course on this uh, immense text, uh, January 15th, 2022. 
Uh, all the information about that course can be found in the link in the description. I will be leading that uh, in order so that we can apply this knowledge to um, our lives so that we can think its meaning in a deeper way for the present moment. And hopefully, as I mentioned at the beginning, work towards a conference which will be live streamed on this channel and also uh, a series of papers and hopefully an edited volume which we can collectively um, construct and which I hope will be of uh, value and service to not only the larger community of philosophy that is still investigating the importance and the meaning of Hegel's work for the present moment, um, but also various other fields of study from psychoanalysis to science to politics to religion, um, because I think Hegel and the thinking in this text uh, still has a lot to offer um, our present moment. So thank you so much for watching the whole way through, if you're still with me. And again, get in touch with me uh, before January 15th if you want to be a part of this course.